Welcome to an MBA admissions masterclass with Fortuna. Uh, and as we have framed this uh, in May, just three or four days since uh, Harvard Business School announced their round one, round two deadlines for September and January in the coming admission cycle, um, we asked the question, is this your best chance to get a Harvard, Stanford or Wharton MBA? This, is this the year when it's the best chance in a generation to get into the M7. Now, why have we framed it that way? Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, all of the top schools had seen tremendous uh, application volumes, numbers getting into school. And then, of course, that first wave of lockdowns and everyone was thinking, hey, it's time to go to business school. But some of those dynamics have changed. And we'll be looking at those in detail. Uh, with my two co-directors at Fortuna, uh, Judith Silverman Hadara, the former Wharton uh, Director of MBA Admissions, and Caroline Diati Edwards, the former INSEAD Director of MBA Admissions. So with those gatekeepers and their perspectives on economic downturns and how that sort of plays out, uh, we hope that uh, the next 45, 50 minutes with you will be uh, you know, a wealth of insight to really help you to make informed decisions about, is this the year? You're gonna seize the day. Uh, you're gonna go out and change lives and change the world as Stanford likes to think about it uh, and go to a fantastic business for school for a wonderful year or two year uh, experience. So uh, I'm at Simmons. Some of you will know me from uh, the Center Court festivals that we organize with Poets and Quants, but I'm very fortunate to uh, work with an extraordinary team at uh, Fortuna. Uh, we have over 40 uh, former gatekeepers from the world's top business schools, from the M7, from what we then describe as the S7, so all of those top 10, top 15 uh, US business schools, and then many of the top international schools, including, of course, INSEAD. I think I have eight colleagues from INSEAD and then uh, London Business School. So I'm the one member of our Fortuna family that never worked in admissions, didn't even go to business school. I've got the t-shirt. Now, of course, my curious George says that he's going to Harvard, but I think getting to the gift store uh, is as close as I will ever get. Um, but You're I'm too a curious modest, one Matt. who asks questions of all of my colleagues and they're incredibly patient with me uh, to share uh, so much tremendous experience that they have. So uh, here are the panelists, and uh, as I said, over the next 45 minutes, we're really gonna take a deeper dive into that coming uh, admissions cycle. The, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported last week um, that they said employers were trying to keep their top talent. We know that it's, uh, it's a very tight uh, job market, particularly uh, in the US. But again, this idea that uh, the M7, it could be your year. So this is the first of three masterclasses uh, that we're running uh, every Wednesday at noon the East Coast. I guess that's what, nine o'clock in the morning on the West Coast, and that might be just around midnight in Mumbai. Uh, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for those additional sessions, looking at other top schools and the various dynamics strategies that you would need to make this uh, your year. So just kicking off, I talked about a new season and that macro context. Expectation is that now numbers might decline. But I think as you look a little deeper, clearly that US job market and employers trying to keep their top talent, you know, we've seen that GMAT test, number, test taker numbers have dropped by as much as 25% uh, in the last 12 months. Now, some of that slack will have been picked up uh, by the GRE or the handful of top schools that have gone test optional uh, for the last year. We're going to be talking uh, about the impact of that. But still, Changes in the White House administration 15 months ago had meant that on the international scene, you know, we've seen numbers from India just shoot upwards. Uh, and Fortune, of course, you know, is a real reference for the industry. So what we see and speaking to so many thousands of clients uh, inquiries every year um, really does enable us to identify some of those international. China hasn't really come back yet, and that's even perhaps some of the geopolitical positioning uh, that is going on. But if demand's going to be down, you know, a school like Wharton caught everybody's breath uh, with a 51.7% intake of women to the last MBA class. All the other schools want to achieve that sort of gender balance and, again, much broader diversity with underrepresented minorities but they're going to fill those places uh, in the classroom uh, and it could just be the levels of competition in the North American market will be very different. So we'll stop and turn 
to the experts. Uh, and, and Judith, just you've, you've seen through 11 years working in admissions at Wharton, the highs and the lows and the Lehman Brothers and dot-com bursts and bubbles. It's typically a counter cycle, is that right? It completely is a counter cycle. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be with you today. And Matt, that is the greatest t-shirt in the history of all MBA t-shirts I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of them in my 30 plus years of admissions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a counter cycle. It's, it's not surprising, but you kind of got to think about it for a minute, which is basically when the economy is doing really well, people don't want to leave their jobs and don't necessarily want to go to business school. But then when the economy is not doing as well, people also figure it's a good place to wait it out, right? So we've seen this before. Um, we watched it. It's really, it goes like this. And when I was at Wharton, um, we definitely watched that happen many times over, um, dot com bubble and bust. Um, Lehman Brothers, certainly, I remember that day incredibly well. We all looked at each other and were like, wow, hold on to your hats, because we were about to get a deluge of applications for the next cycle, and we knew that. Um, and so a lot of people recognize that um, it's, it's a good place to park yourself for two years and to really gain some skills. Um, some folks like to leave before the going gets really bad. Um, in the economy and, you know, kind of ensure that they're going to have a place um, in, in an incoming class, but it is never surprising. Um, and I guess what my, my feeling on it is it always takes a little while to recognize that it's happening and then boom, it really happens. And so in my mind, that is why this is a particularly good time to be applying to business school. And as Matt said, this is like a once in a lifetime a generation possibly opportunity um, given what we're looking at in terms of volumes of applicants. So completely agree with your assessment, Matt, on, on that point. So, I mean, Judith, this is one of the biggest decisions that people will make. Uh, the doors that it can open, uh, you know, the opportunities to go and have that impact, this extraordinary network, we'll be talking about some of those different uh, factors. I suppose I was wondering, as I listened to Goldman Sachs and others saying, oh, you know, given supply chain, clearly uh, announcements from the Fed and what's going to happen with interest rates, you know, this word recession is being bandied around a lot. Could it be that there's even a strategy for round one? when volumes might still be lower in a tight job market. And then if things really do turn sour by the end of the year, mm -hmm. that then people will head into round two. So, so there's, hey, get in for round one, mm -hmm. just to sort of not then be part of a rush for those January deadlines. Yes. And this is a, a two part answer. I, you know, I always, we always tell students apply when you're ready. So don't feel like you have to rush it. You know, it's not a round one or never, but we have seen this before. And again, again, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but if you're watching the Fed interest rates, it, it is going to impact what happens in the United States. And then, you know, not surprisingly globally. So I, I do think we are looking right now, we're mid-May. If you're thinking about applying to business school, getting getting um, you know, an action plan together for September would, would serve you very well. You might decide you're gonna to apply to one or two of your top schools and maybe one or two of your, of your mid-tier schools to kind of spread out the wealth a little bit, um, which, is, which is a game plan that we really um, appreciate and, and definitely encourage our students to think about. Um, but you've got enough time now to both take the GMAT or the GRE and get applications going um, you know, for September without it feeling like a panic rush. Um, the other thing I'll say is that there's always gonna be room for quality. So um, the, you know, the, as, I, as, I, as I, Matt has often heard me say, Wharton, Harvard, and Stanford are round agnostic, which means they don't really care when you apply. Um, they've, they've got room for candidates, both round, and one, two, round one and two and three if needed for some schools. Um, but again, this is a, a pretty unusual place that we're in right now where we kind of see the pressure building and in terms of applicant numbers. Um, so now is kind of like, if you're looking at it like an ocean, you're still kind of got time to ride in the wave before you know, the bigger wave is coming in back of you. Right. Caroline, from the international perspective, schools like INSEAD, of course, that you know so well and, and, and a one-year program that calculates a very different ROI. I mean, it's, it, it's a great investment any year, but, but how have you sort of seen those different counter cycles play through and how that might guide applicants decisions yes well when i took the role at INSEAD um, when i joined as admissions director 
one of the first things I did um, after I had sort of dug up my own admissions file and seen what the interviewers and the file reader had said about me when the, when I was admitted to the program, it was quite fascinating. Um, did you blush? <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised. I had one interview that I thought hadn't gone brilliantly and, and I had an absolutely glowing review from that interviewer. So, you know, it goes, just goes to show that you never know. Um, so, so I did spend some time sort of digging through the historical data um, of the admission statistics over the decades, right? It's quite fascinating. And it's a very clear correlation, as you said, between um, the economic cycle, um, an economic upturn driving a downturn in application volume. And that doesn't really pick up again until um, uh, you know, it doesn't really turn around again until there's an, an, until there's uh, you know the, the economic cycle shifts again. So so it's a very clear correlation. Of course, you know, 2020 was a very interesting year because, as Judith said, you know, normally with an economic cycle, it sort of changes slowly and it, it gradually has an impact on application volume. Whereas March 2020, we'll never forget, right? It was like turning on a tap. Um, there was suddenly a deluge of people throwing their hats into the ring applying to business school um, and so you know the, the cycle literally switched overnight which we'd never seen before um, but what i also observed when i was at INSEAD is that uh, you know with the cycle um, and i think you know we've seen that with the pandemic there are people who are thinking about okay well you know maybe i'll apply to business school sometime in the next um, you know year to three years and then when there's an economic downturn or you know a shock like the pandemic they all apply at once right so people that triggers a a, a a surge of applications and so what has happened is you've pulled forward your your potential pipeline for 12 months time for two years time maybe even three years time some of those people who might have applied later on that has all been pulled forward to one moment in time or one cycle and so now I think schools are also seeing a bit of the hangover of the pandemic where they have seen, um, you know, that, that deluge um, that was triggered by the pandemic and some of those people who might otherwise have applied now, but they, you know, actually had the time on their hands in 2020 and 2021. And so they applied at that point. So, and, you know, I, I think it's already um, having an impact on schools. So. What we've heard is that schools um, for the entry starting this fall, um, they're already struggling with yield, right? And um, schools are clearing um, more people than expected from the wait lists um, because some people are hesitating about going off to business school because they're getting promotions, they're getting pay rises, they're getting great job offers um, with a strong job market. Um, and um, and I think, you know, perhaps application volume also dropped towards the end of this current cycle, right? So maybe round three was smaller than some schools expected. I think that might have happened too. So so it, it um, I do think that this year application volume will be down. And as you've said, um, I think that is going to be more the case in round one than possibly later rounds, right? We, we do expect that there's going to be um you know we could be heading into recession in 2023 and and if that does happen then the shot cycle will shift again so um so i do think that this year um could represent you know the best time in between you know that pandemic high of 2021 and potentially recession in 2023. Right. Um, i mean as the nasdaq and the s p 500 constantly remind us you know selling at the top buying at the bottom you know timing the market is, is always so difficult is, is there any sense for, for either of you um given what we were seeing through round three and, and yield management all the way through to the intake in september you know some candidates will think even within their own firms oh you know those those in the front office those glamorous positions they were the ones more likely to secure places in boston philadelphia palo alto uh, and there i am in the back office as a research analyst do you think their time has come and, and that you know um, just with others looking the other direction that, that there is this sort of pool and, and that you know hashtag m7 for me this could be their year yeah i mean i do think that um for some of the profiles where 
they may have been at a disadvantage for for certain reasons and it could be because it's a common profile in the pool right you know i'm, I'm another management consultant i'm another back office investment banker um, and there's lots of people with that profile applying in a context where um you know the job market is very strong and so fewer of those people feel motivated to apply right now to business school um, that's actually the time when you should be applying, right? If you have that common profile, because, um, you know, you have less competition, which I think, you know, as you say, is particularly important to keep in mind for people with that, that common background, that typical sort of feeder profile into business school. Right. And from a diversity perspective, I mean, Judith Wharton, of course, is, is uh, justifiably uh, proud of bringing in the sort of gender balance that they achieved this year. But I mean, all of the top schools, you know, whether it's on gender, other areas of diversity and inclusion, they're going to be looking for diverse talent beyond banking, beyond consulting, beyond software engineers. So they're all out there looking uh, for very diverse talent. Without a doubt. And I think that, you know, the when you're thinking about um, opportunity, um, that talent is going to come in a lot of different ways, right? And, and there are some things that are going to remain constant, right? So there's there's always going to be an interest in academic capability and in your scores and in your extracurriculars and in, you know, your career trajectory. But there's also a lot, you know, Matt, you mentioned earlier, Wharton has has now a greater percentage of women enrolled in the program than they do men, which is which was the, they were the first school to do that. Other schools are you know very much in the hunt. <coughs> excuse me for that as well. Um, a lot more of um, students coming from non traditional backgrounds. Um, we actually just helped um, a young opera singer who's going to be going to CBS in the fall. Um, has no back, you know a wonderful story. Had had no background in business. Although she maintained and presented that she was her product, right? So she was marketing herself to become to get roles and to work with a company. And so, so lots of, of opportunity for people that aren't coming out of the traditional banking, consulting, tech. Um, additionally, lots of individuals that um, might have started in a field that didn't didn't appear to have a connection with business to begin with, right? So um, lots of students that are, that are coming out and curious about opportunities for the MBA. Um, that doesn't mean, again, that there's not gonna be that continued push from those three large industry pools, but, but without a doubt, and, and certainly some of this has to do with the two plus two and deferred entry programs, students thinking about business school earlier in their academic careers and not necessarily thinking, oh, you know, I have to go sort of lockstep into one of these industries and to, into, uh, to eventually attend. So from my perspective, the diversity is very much there. Um, and it is, uh, uh, you know, without, without sounding like we're, we're saying the same thing over and over and over, there's going to be a lot of opportunity in round one of this year. We all know it for people that are coming from feeder industries and people that aren't. Um, and, and, you know, we could give you lists of folks that are, that are just coming from backgrounds that you, in a million years, you wouldn't have expected that they would be interested in business school or admitted, and, and they have been. So that's something that we've been very We're aware. being followed by, by, by hundreds of people and others will then be catching this on Fortuna's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, great to, to also have you with us. Um, send in your questions if they are of the quality of the first question we just had. Uh, it's a real zinger uh, that looks at that hot job market and the fact that McKinsey and others are now hiring uh, associates, you know, with, with great starting salary. So they're sort of saying, you know, what's the value of the MBA? Have we placed too much emphasis on that first salary coming out of business school? I mean, Caroline, of course, there are great rewards. We see these extraordinary jumps that you can make coming out of the top schools, but it's more than that first position. I mean, the MBA is then setting you up not just for that first job, but for the third, for the fifth position, levels of seniority opportunities that will then follow. Yes, it's, it's a very good point and, and a very good question. Um, and that's why people are hesitating to head off to business school right now, precisely because they're getting those great job offers and promotions and salary increases and so on. So they're questioning whether it makes sense for them financially. Um, I think it's really important to take a long term perspective and all of the studies that look at return on investment, you know, whether it's in the short term or in the longer term, show that, you know, especially if you go to a strong program, um, you know, you will see quite an impressive return financially over time. 
And I think, um, you know, there is, there's also a lot of unquantifiable aspects as well. I think that an MBA gives you the ability to, um, to, to change careers, not just when you come out of the MBA initially, but also, you know, it, at any point in your career, right? It, it opens doors that otherwise might have remained closed and give you, gives you a network of support that is, that is a wonderful um, asset to have. Um, so, you know, and I think it gives you the ability um, in a context of uncertainty, right? And, you know, who knows what the job market is going to look like in 10 years time, right? Even in five years time, never mind, 20 years time when, when current people heading off to business school are coming to the ends of their careers, right? We, we don't know um, what the jobs will be even. So having the ability to reinvent yourself, I think is incredibly valuable and having that you know, that solid foundation of skills, that means that you feel confident and you have the ability to tackle running any part of a business, right? You're not stuck in a particular function, whether it's finance or marketing, but you have the credibility and the confidence to, to tackle any challenge that comes your way. Um, and so, you know, I think that there is huge value in that in the long term, in a context where we will continue to go through economic cycles, right? And, and, um, you know, I've seen it myself um, with my own um, peer group um, from INSEAD. You know, I graduated, graduated in 2003. Uh, my husband's peer group um, from Stanford, um, GSB 98. You know, people go through unexpected challenges. You sort of imagine that your career is going to be this sort of constant um, trajectory of, you know, progression over time but it's not like that it's often a roller coaster and you know even for the the best qualified people um and the most talented people unexpected things happen and so it's incredibly valuable to have that that strong foundation that credential and that network of people who are willing to help you when you when you um you know you face an unexpected challenge so i think you know i would really encourage candidates to take the long-term view and not just think about, oh, great, you know, I've got this extra um, $20,000 um, in my salary this year, you know, maybe I won't head off to business school. Um, you know, really, please do take the long-term perspective because I think that, um, you know, it, it's it's a huge asset to have and it will stand you in very good stead for the future. One thing I wanted to piggyback on that Caroline just mentioned is when, and we're gonna talk about this later, but when you start to research schools, don't just talk to current students, talk to people that are five years out and talk to people that are like 10 to 12 years out because you're really gonna start to see that is the long-term value that Caroline was talking about. Um, sure, you may get X when you graduate, you know, and, and why should that number doesn't seem that much more than it might be right now. But if you look again, look at the long haul um, or the long tail and, and you'll see that that impact is very long lasting. So um, although sometimes students will say, oh yeah, I talked to five current students and this is what I learned about Harvard, really go deeper than that. Um, do yourself a favor and, and see what those long-term impacts can look like. That's definitely something that I would recommend. Right. Uh, just on the financials, a couple of points, and starting, Caroline, for the international schools, you know, INSEAD, LBS, that have seen such strong demand, certainly uh, through four years of the Trump administration. Um, the dollar is almost at parity with the euro. So <laughs> INSEAD, IMD, well, there's always the Swiss franc, right? But, you know, across the euro uh, and the pound, um, that, that US dollar goes a long way, and it's impact similarly against, you know, whether it's uh, reals or rupees or the RMB. Um, do, do you think that will uh, sort of factor into people's calculations? Yeah, I think it will benefit um, some of the European schools, right? It will mean that it, it will be more affordable, you know, especially the one year format of many of the, uh, the top international programs. Already, it's a very compelling case financially. And a lot of people do go that route because um, it's less of a financial outlay. Initially, you know, you are forgoing your salary um, for one year rather than two um, and living costs, et cetera, et cetera, makes a big difference. So, you know, schools like INSEAD always do incredibly well um, in studies of return on investment because, you know, not least because of the one year format. Um, and with the um, those currency fluctuations that you mentioned, yes, I do think that the, the international schools will benefit from that. So, um, so it may be that, um, you know, whilst there, it may be that we see more of a downturn 
in the US domestic market than in the international market um, with um, possibly schools like INSEAD, ASHA IE, um, et cetera, benefiting from that, um, this, that, that currency um, situation over the next 12 months. Right. And Judith, even as we think about round three or, or, or yield management now for September and perhaps how that might play through the following year, do, do you think that will have impact on financial aid? A lot of that has been a sort of allocated to achieve the diversity that schools have placed so much emphasis on. But if they're fighting for candidates, uh, could that uh, influence the way that they approach financial aid in the next year? So I just want to make sure I understand. You mean in round three financial aid or sort of coming up for round one? Well, I suppose we have right now and schools that say, no, join us in September and we'll actually, uh, you know, maybe put money on the table that wasn't available before. But how might that play through to next year? Uh, and decisions that they make around financial aid? So, you know, certainly schools are, are anxious to nail down their classes. Um, you know, in many of uh, the schools are releasing interview invitations to sort of the two plus two and round three applicants now. They're gonna get a sense of their yield very quickly because the third round tends to speed up, the volume's not there. Um, and they are gonna make sure that if they are not getting their yields, that they're gonna do what they can to ensure that they've got some students that are, you know, they, they can't go back and, and reissue funding to people that were already admitted, but they can certainly do play a little bit of catch up, Matt, with round three. And I, and I do believe that that will be the case. Um, I also think that they're gonna be keeping their eyes open and they're gonna to wanna to lock in that talent very early um, in round one for next year. So they are also sort of stealing themselves against like, we wanna make sure that we get this person to be here. So let's sweeten the pot a little bit. Um, and especially for um, diversity candidates. Um, and and that's, that's sort of, to me, that's, that's gonna only intensify um, in the coming cycle. So it might not be enough money for someone to make a decision on, right? It might not you know, switch you from, oh, I'm gonna go here, but XYZ is giving me 10,000. But for, you know, for some students, that may be enough of a difference. So it doesn't have to always be a huge outlier of like a full ride, but it could be an indication that a school is very interested in you. Um, and sometimes schools will, will add on to that, right, Matt? They'll give you access to, um, you know, to the deans. They'll give you access to certain research or networking opportunities. So schools have gotten very savvy about how to let a student know that they really want them and it doesn't all have to be financial. So lots of different pieces of that puzzle um, to consider. But I'll be very, um, I am fascinated by this topic and I, I'm gonna be looking at the round three awards very closely to see if schools are a little nervous about making sure they get their yields um, you know, as they, as, they, as they really wrap up this year's class. Right. I, I learned last week that um, one of the top 10 schools, uh, there's, there are professors at the school that are currently spending half of their time, not in the classroom, but talking to uh, candidates that have been off made offers. So the schools are rolling out the red carpet and with everything that both of you have said, here's, here's the crystal ball moment. As, as I look at uh, the remainder of this year and as we approach that 2022-2023 uh, 2022, admission cycle, we're gonna be looking at even impact on uh, changing uh, admissions. You know, are they gonna sort of um, uh, come up with new essays, uh, videos? You know, so, so is this the time to play with different techniques uh, and of course how will the schools continue with GMAT and GRE waivers several of you have written with questions but I think it's going to play across those two rounds and those that apply in round one particularly from uh, the US market that that white guy on Wall Street has probably never had a better chance than to get in, in sept applying in September 2022 I absolutely adhere to Judith's comment about you know apply when it's the right time for you but if we do hit that recession, and a lot of uh, the, the signs are, are there, then you know Caroline's comment about um, you know getting in before suddenly this big wave because it does come in waves, uh, and round two could be a, a real rush. Certainly, we're there to answer these questions. Look at your profiles, being ready whether it's for September, January, or it could be for next year to really make the right decision for you. Now, what goes into all of the decision making and on? That's where we're going to uh, take you next and what the schools are looking for. The, the fundamentals, Judith, we'll talk about GM, GMAT and GRE later, but the fundamentals haven't changed. Those core factors, just, just talk us through, you know, what any of the world's top business schools is really looking for in a great applicant. 
So um, I had been at Wharton for, for quite a number of years. And so my comments are sort of based on, on that experience um, as the acting director of admissions and also in the students that we've been working with for about a decade at Fortuna. And there's some things that are constant, right? The academic ability. So no matter what you studied in undergrad, was it something that you were focused on? Were you performing? Were you taking classes that were challenging to you? Do you have the quantitative chops to be able to survive and thrive in a, an academically quantitative environment? Um, and so certainly that transcript, the school record is gonna be a very important part of the review that goes on. Um, in addition, is going to be your track record professionally. We talked a little bit earlier about not necessarily coming out of, um, you know, those feeder industries. But what are, you know, what are the steps that you've taken within the context of your career? Have you been mentoring individuals at this stage? Have you been working on a lot of teams? Have you been sort of, um, you know, an integral part of the organization where you work? So more than just an employee. But is this something that you're really working to build and have an impact on? And so as schools review your resume, they're going to be looking for that certain kinds of keywords that are going to show to them that out of college, you were doing this kind of work and had these kinds of responsibilities. And then that, that increasingly over the you know, past three to six years that you've really been growing in the ways that you're taking, uh, taking control of your own career narrative and that you've been increasing not only in responsibilities, but in the ways that you're able to affect outcome. So that's certainly gonna be important. Um, schools are gonna be wanna see that, uh, uh, not surprisingly that you are, there are things that you care about outside of work. Um, I know that is really, really tricky with COVID and two years of not being able to do much, but if you do have things that you're involved with, Hopefully you'll be able to continue to engage with them moving forward. Um, lots of opportunities for those that, that are still not meeting in person, but you can you know, get involved online. And that definitely um, is a little bit of a hangover from COVID admittedly, that schools understand that if you ordinarily were involved in an after-school basketball program for kids in your neighborhood, you know, that wasn't happening. Um, and a lot of people will time, spend their free time at work you know, parts of, of different affinity groups, um, working on recruitment for incoming associates and things or mentoring, things of that nature. So there's not a magic, there's not a magic um, extracurricular activities. It's, it's not like working in a soup kitchen is, is looking better for you than playing rugby. Schools are just wanna see that what you bring, you're bringing your full authentic self to the program, academically, professionally, and extracurricularly as well. So those are all gonna be important. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about the ways in which you can really strengthen your profile between now and those deadlines. But I would say that really, you know, on paper, so many of the students that apply are really admissible to the schools that you're considering. And what's going to help you to really stand out in those pools are the ways that you're presenting who you are as an individual and, and what that narrative is going to be which is why people like Caroline and myself, we really work with students very, very consistently and, and, and deeply to help them bring out those stories and those examples and those experiences that are really gonna help to shape those other kinds of things that are set by the schools, academics, professional and extracurricular. And with all of those stories and experiences, Caroline, it's it's probably um, it's still premature to talk about a world post COVID. You know, we're still only slowly emerging from uh, the, the last two years. But anyone that's in the coming admission cycle will have been affected in some way. You know, whether uh, their, their particular industry, working in the airline industry, for example, um, remote working. Uh, you know, it's, it's had so many different impacts. This is something that the admissions office will be preparing itself for in, in the next uh, sort of cohort of applicants. Yeah, yes, that's right. And, um, you know, as Judith said, schools understand that your opportunities may have been affected by what has happened over the last two years. And, you know, we've worked with a lot of candidates who are very concerned about how um, you know, the impact that it's had on their, their ability to do certain things and, um, and, you know, especially extracurriculars and so on, you know, how, how that will be perceived by the admissions office. But, um, you know, the schools, everyone's been through this, right? We've all been through this together. So the schools absolutely do understand the dynamics. Um, and some schools actually have specific questions about, you know, how has it impacted you? Uh, and what have you, you know, what have you done during the pandemic? And so, um, you know, I think it's important to show that 
rather than just having been sort of you know passively affected by it that you've also been proactive um in in um taking opportunities uh perhaps to you know to help people who who might need help or to support colleagues who may be struggling with working in an online environment um you know it, it impacted people in very different ways and so you know some schools are actually specifically asking questions about you know what what, what have you done um over the past couple of years um to have some you know some sort of positive impact so um uh you know as so as we come out of that you know i think about what stories you have um but also you know now people are able to get back to as you said um doing some more activities that might not have been possible beforehand and um extracurriculars are important so you know if you've got out of the habit you know if you've left that basketball coaching team because you know it all sort of fell apart in march 2020 you know, see what you can do to get back to doing something where you know you you have um a a commitment and and um, an ongoing activity um that, you, that will show what sort of student you'll be that i mean that's what the schools are looking for is they want to see that you're a well-rounded candidate who has interests beyond um, beyond work and study, and they want to see what sort of student you're going to be when you get to the campus, and and what sort of alum you will be. Are you someone who's going to be actively engaged in the network? Um, so if you know if your extracurriculars have slipped over the pandemic, I mean that's perfectly understandable. But but now is the time to get back to doing something if you can, and if you have had a hiatus in your extracurriculars. Um, and you're looking at applying, you know, especially if you're looking at applying in round one, I wouldn't suggest, you know, starting something completely new. Um, you know, suddenly, as you said, you know, volunteering in the in the soup kitchen, if that's not something that you've done before. Um, but try to pick up on something that's related to what you what you have done before to show that it's something that is, you know, a genuine interest and ongoing engagement, even if you have had um ha have, you know, had a hiatus during the pandemic period. Now, I'm always very lucky to sit down with both of you, with other colleagues from Fortuna. Uh, also get to sit down with Kirsten Moss, the Admissions Director at Stanford, Chad Losey for, from HBS, Blair Mannix from Wharton and, and many, many others. You know, around these issues that you're both describing, um, it's not, well, there's the line in my resume. It's then being able to share with the school, what does it say about adaptability what does it say about innovative mm. thinking and 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 this is a lot of our work at fortuna right to then be able to sort of join dots and show whether it was in the community whether it was through the last two years of remote working how these different sort of behaviors emerge resilience uh, leadership and, and judith i mean that's a big part of then being able to show those different behaviors and characteristics to the admissions office a hundred percent. And I was, I was talking to somebody yesterday um, who was a was a boulderer. She she liked to climb. She was a surfer. She liked to boulder, and she liked to look at the stars. And I was like, "This is a great story. Let me tell you why." And so we talked about, well, what does that say about her? You know, she's what does it say about her ability to see a route up a mountain? What does it say about her ability to see things that maybe other people don't see? What does it see about her ability to be patient and to wait for opportunities, right? So, so really, I, I believe that the things that you choose to do professionally and outside of work and outside of school say a lot about you as a person and really a lot about how you're going to be in a business setting. So if, you know, you, it, again, it doesn't have to be, and I, I think sometimes students feel like, oh, I have to really do something that's great for my community, or I have to, you know, re, I have to tutor kids, or I have to work in a hospital. It's, it's just a, it informing how you see the world. Um, and most people that, that do what Caroline, myself and Matt do are able, that's why we're, we're in, this, in this position is that we like finding those paths. We love talking with students and saying, well, you know, here are the ways that we see that you can really pull in those characteristics from what you do and, and how and help show a school why that is relevant for who you are as an individual. Um, and I'm just reflecting, I literally had this conversation yesterday afternoon and I could see how she could pull in the threads from these three things that she loves and she's chosen. And what does that say about her? And it's completely matched up with what she does for a living, 
right? So, um, and, and how she imagines that business school is going to come, is going to come into play with all of that. So right. it's, um, the business schools are not looking for you to be anything other than what you actually are, but, and they're very interested to hear your perspective on how did that shape you as a person? Um, and in an effect, if you join their community or their town, or, you know, I, I like to look at it like they're building this town and they're choosing their residents for the next two years or the next year. So they, they want to see what talents and skills and, and personal characteristics you're going to be bringing to that, to that uh, grouping and, the, and, and that town, if you will. I, I know that with my colleagues at Fortune, I mean, we place so much emphasis on enjoying and embracing this opportunity to apply to a business school, stepping back after maybe three, four crazy years to really have this you know, sort of gift of uh, introspection. Think about your story, choices that you've made, a path uh, that you've taken. So, so here's our core. Now, you know, we've also reflected, would there be elements of the uh, admissions process that, that might change? You know, we've had a, a, a great deal of, deal of uh, sort of um, consolidation uh, of uh, applications in the last two, three years. Can you see, Caroline, as we do now emerge post-pandemic, that schools might start to play with the questions that they're asking or even the formats in which they're looking to evaluate applicants? Yeah, I do think we might see some changes this year um, because the schools really haven't had the chance to come up for breath right until now. So it has been such a crazy couple of years for them with the deluge of applications, but also, you know, um, during that period, managing a very volatile yield, um, you know, a lot of uncertainty about who was actually ever going to turn up on campus or who could turn up on campus, right, in, in, in those classes during the pandemic. Um, and then, um, as well as, you know, all the challenges of actually, you know, managing life on campus during COVID. So, so they've been under, you know, tremendous pressure um, for a couple of years. And now, finally, things are getting back to some sort of normal. And um, so any um, changes that they had sort of at the back of their minds for the past couple of years would have been put, you know, very much on the back burner because they just didn't have the bandwidth to process, um, you know, how to roll out a change and, and, and to manage that. So, um, so whilst things have been pretty stable for a couple of years, I, I do think that um, we may see some, some new questions, some experimentation come up um, this year, uh, you know, possibly less likely with schools like Harvard and Stanford who don't change things very often, right? I mean, Stanford has that iconic question that has been um, rolled out every year for about the last 20 years now um, and, and seems to work very well for them. So um, possibly those schools and, and HBS has, has already announced that they're keeping their essays the same um, for this year. But I think mm. that um, we may see some innovations coming through from other schools. And what we have seen over the past few years is increasing use of video questions. And I think, you know, that will only continue because the feedback that I get from um, the admissions offices at schools that do use these video questions is that, you know, they, they love those videos. It's, it's a super useful snapshot of a candidate. Um, and, you know, especially if they're not uh, otherwise meeting the candidate in person, right? Some of the schools use alumni for interviewing. Um, and so whilst they get very valuable feedback from the interviewers, um, the, the admissions um, committee themselves will never actually meet those candidates in many cases. So, so having a, um, you know, a few snippets of video um, to actually observe the candidate live um, or, you know, recorded, but, you know, in an, in an um, uh sometimes an unscripted setting to see you know how they think on their feet um that is is um very uh useful in person um and and can be very valuable um to the admissions office so i think that we may see more of those video elements coming through as well if, if um stanford still does have what matters most to you and why this year we're going to have send kristen uh, kirsten and her team a big old 20th birthday birthday cake right um and, and judith you always said you know from what we envied them that question i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall with you as you were thinking about you know what are the questions that reveal wharton has introduced this aspect of contributing to your community i mean it must have taken you a lot of thinking and, and nuance uh to, to to find the most revealing questions Yes, and I'm smiling because I think that Wharton still hasn't gotten it quite as right as Harvard and Stanford. I remember 
So the GMAC conference, which is the big industry conference, is usually held in June. And all the schools would rally around each other before they went. And they would try to figure out what their questions were going to be for the coming year. And, and we would look around at each other. You know, there were like 15 of us on, the, on our committee. It's like, like, we're intelligent people. How come we can't come up with anything nearly as like, you know, on the mark as these two schools. So in my mind, you know, the, the Wharton question is definitely expanding a little bit. They want to know more about your contribution. It's no longer just, you know, what are you going to do here? Um, and what do you want to do afterwards? But um, the schools generally are in two different camps, three, if you count the creative, you know, the creatives. So there's generally like the who are you? What matters to you? Stanford asks, why do you want to go here? Wharton wants, uh, excuse me, Harvard wants to know who you are. Columbia and, and Wharton are very pragmatic. And then if you throw in the NYUs, which have, you know, pick six or different kinds of video options or different kinds of what song really resonates with you, which I happen to love. You learn a lot about people by hearing their favorite songs. Um, so I, Matt, myself and Caroline were talking about this the other day that we, we think that there's, there was a hiatus on changing things up because everything else was changing, right? School was online for about a year. Um, a lot of testing wasn't taking place. Incredibly difficult to get students on campus to understand what the culture was like. So I, if you look at it like a science experiment, I think that some of the schools are gonna to move to change their end this year, change some of those essay questions up um, just so they can see sort of, you know, they're, they're testing. It's, it's always testing and testing and testing to see how you're gonna get the, the best sense of who those individuals are. Um, so again, we know that Harvard's not changing. We don't think Stanford's gonna change, but I, I, I do believe that we're gonna see some changes in some of those other schools um, that are represented you know, in the M7 and the, Matt, Matt, what are they called? The Fabulous Six? What's the other moniker that you call them? Uh, so if we, so what have we got? The M7 and people have different opinions on what the M stands for. Yes. And then there's the S7 or the S10. I mean, yes. how big should that group be? You could probably have the European Five. Um, yes, I have no I doubt. I mean, they're, they're all clusters of fantastic schools. So, um, and then, and then well, I forgot to uh, mention, they, of course, you know, the, the LBS and the um, and NCIAD, which, which have many more questions than the US schools do looking for different, you know, different kinds of really, really drilling down on certain parts of your career. Um, so, so lots of things to think about. Um, one word of advice for those that you're, that are listening is, is don't get completely freaked out if you're applying to like six or seven schools, because you can group them, right? You can sort of say, well, these schools are asking about my general sense of being, and these schools are really asking me very direct questions. So I, I, I like to say, when you have a chance, look at all the schools, make a spreadsheet, and it's not as bad as you actually think it is. Yeah. I mean, we very often may focus on one or two schools with the idea that that will carry over to others but as you say sort of that that matrix now a, a very popular question was around the gmat and the gre we start to sort we were starting to see this change um and of course in through 2020 and that final crazy round for september 2020 um kellogg and other schools were all dropping uh, test requirements and, and then it carried through you know sloan uh, was a school that maintained a policy through the 2021 2022 uh, admission cycle um of um you know optional testing my question is you know is that disingenuous if you've got two great candidates both went to a junior I ivy league school with comparable gpas they're both working at a strategy consulting firm, a bank, or you know, a successful software engineer. One is sharing a 730, 740 on the GMAT, or what might that be, a 328 on the GRE, and the other one doesn't have a test score. So, um, Caroline, wh wh where do you see GMAT and GRE going? And also that very popular article that you wrote about how high test scores are, looking back from that, I've just given you a lot to answer. Yeah, well, so I, so as you said, you know, we saw um, schools becoming much more flexible um, due to the pandemic when testing was so much more difficult. And most of the top schools have gone back to requiring tests. Um, MIT, as you said, through the last cycle um, was test optional. Um, for the, on the undergrad side, MIT has just announced that they are now going to be requiring tests again, which they weren't for the last season. So I think it's quite possible that MIT Sloan may also um, go back to requiring tests rather than being the only M7 school that doesn't require them. Um, so 
you know, and I, I think, as you say, if, if one candidate has got a very strong GMAT and another candidate has no GMAT, um, you know, it's not the only thing that they're looking at, obviously, right? I mean, schools really are looking at every aspect of your profile and it's very, un it would be very unusual that two candidates would have absolutely identical tracks in every way, right? So it's probably not the only thing that they're, that differentiates them. Um, but it does show, um, you know, that there is a strong correlation between the, the, the GMAT um, and, um, or the GRE and how people do academically on the program. And, you know, as I said earlier, um, I was kind of fascinated to look through some of the data at NCED when I first um, started working at the school. And, um, and that was something else that we did um, a lot of analysis into was looking at, you know, the different elements that we are um, examining at the in the admissions process and then actually what are the outcomes how do people do during the program how do they do when they graduate and actually um you know i came into the school um having uh you know done the gmat myself obviously attended the program and then a couple of years later coming back um to work as admissions director and i was very skeptical about the value of the gmat um but <laughs> But the data is there. There is a strong correlation um, between how people do on the GMAT and how people do academically, right? And it, it makes sense. The GMAT was designed specifically as a test for business schools, right? The GRE is broader. It wasn't specifically designed for business schools, or it does measure many of the same skills, but the GME, GRE, uh, the GMAT is very business school specific. And so there is value there. Um, especially when you've got a very diverse pool of people coming from very different academic backgrounds, as you as you may have at a, um, a very diverse school like INSEAD or, or London Business School, um, some of the other international programs. So I think that, um, you know, if you're aspiring to apply to a top school, you should definitely be planning on taking one of these tests. Um, I wouldn't count on MIT remaining test optional. We'll, we'll see, but I think you know there's a big question mark there. Um, a lot of the other programs beyond the very top schools um, are maintaining test optional, right? And I think that's probably likely to continue. It just gives them more flexibility um, to to encourage people to apply who might not have um, had the chance or the time to jump through that hoop and it does take you know it's a significant investment of time right most people mm. do have to spend a few months preparing um if they really want to do as well as they can on the gmat or the gre so it's 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 definitely not for the faint-hearted right i mean it, it, it's not much fun i well remember myself having to you know come back and slog through practice questions in the evening when i was you know already exhausted after a full day at work so it's not easy um uh and so uh you know it's definitely something that you want to anticipate as far ahead as you can and get out of the way um before you dive into the application process judith just to finish on on tests and their continued impact in this whole process um i, I was doing a, a panel uh, with Stanford at the NASDAQ Center and, and Kirsten said, you know, I, I, I think uh, Stanford's GMAT averages are too high. The audience was like, what? <laughs> what, what did Stanford? <laughs> I think it was like seven. It was at 738 uh, that particular year. You know, Caroline's uh, great interview with uh, with Virginie from INSEAD saying, you know, don't count yourself out if you've got 660, 670s compared to our school average of 70. We're still yeah. looking at you. And that's the message. I can some, sometimes understand candidates being a little skeptical. Well, you know, like they're, they're bound to say that. But that was the case, right? You, you, you no longer work in the Wharton office, so you can speak freely, Judith. You were looking at so much more. I feel like I'm in a witness protection program. <laughs> I can speak with, that, with, the, with immunity. Um, there's so many other things that they're looking for, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, but a perfect score is not that interesting. Um, it's nice, but there's a lot of them. So honestly, what, you know, the, the schools don't want to fill their classes with people that are only really good at taking tests or did, you know, have 4.0 undergrads. I think that there's so many other interesting parts of everybody's background and experiences that, that makes them unusual. So I'm not saying that means you can walk in with a 610, but I'm definitely saying don't count yourself out because there's more to you than whatever you did in that three hours of your life. And I think that schools, I know that schools 
from experience are very much aware of that. And yeah, there's a lot of pounding of tables and gnashing of teeth and, and um, getting up at 11 o'clock and walking around the admissions table and coming back and, you know, humping like, Ugh! you know, for to fight for a candidate. Um, at least that's what I recall from our days eating Chinese food very late at night at Wharton um, as we were going through the applications. But it, it's because because people that are in admissions really are on your side. They're not looking for reasons to deny you. They're looking for reasons to admit you. So without without overstating, the test is just part of it. And yes, you should prepare. And yes, you should take it seriously. And yes, you're going to take it more than once because nobody does well their first time out of the gate pretty much universally. Um, but, but keep in mind that if you're introducing yourself to somebody you're sitting next to at a bar or in a coffee shop, you're not going to blurt out what your scores are the first time you meet them, right? There's lots of other interesting things that you want to share. And that's really what the schools are looking for. Um, I think that curious, curious George going to Harvard, he, he needs to make that the t-shirt that just quietly says, you know, 740 and, and maybe indicates a quant <laughs> score because, you know, they, they do look at the, the breakdown, but someone that's written and said, well, you know, between 740 and 770, of course, 77, 770 shines a little more. But if you were about to then spend the next 60 hours um, in, in the coming uh, three, four months, to nudge that score another 10 or 20 points. Think about how you could use that time, you know, with Caroline and Judith talking about habits of leadership and impact uh, contributions in the community. That's an opportunity cost. So, you know, hey, that 740, I think that's probably something that can use. And the reality is uh, that, you know, we are now, what is it, 120 days to Harvard Business School's round one deadline. That's plenty of time to put together a really compelling story. Mm -hmm. But what, what are those uh, next steps? And uh, perhaps you can both talk us through. And from there, with some of these great questions that have come in, maybe we'll have like a quick fire uh, Q&A session at the end, uh, get through some of those questions. And, and um, of course, people can follow up with us afterwards. But um, perhaps starting with, uh, with you, Caroline, just in terms of some of the next steps. Yeah, so as you say, um, now is the um, time to really start playing out um, sort of week by week and possibly even day by day what you need to do between now and the deadlines, um, because it is it is time to get serious. So so if you're looking at round one um, and you haven't taken the test already, then, you know, that's definitely, I think, should be your first priority. Um, I, I think for most candidates, um, it's ideal to take the test if you're taking the test um, before you then dive into the written application because it can just be hard to juggle everything at the same time right when you've already got a demanding day job no doubt so um so you know i would definitely encourage candidates to get their testing out of the way first if possible um and then you know an, an important step at this stage is to also be thinking about who your recommenders will be and you know i advise candidates to have at least three people in mind at this stage um, who could be great advocates for you because uh, things can happen at the last minute, right? You know, someone may get sick, they may, you know, for whatever reason, not be available to um, to submit um, when the time comes. So, so it's good to have in mind at least three people um, and begin to have conversations with them, all right? And, and um, I think a great way to initiate that discussion and sort of gauge, um, their willingness to to really be a champion for you is not to just ask them, um, would you be my recommender? Um, but to ask them to phrase it a bit differently um, and gauge their reaction and, and tell them that you're applying to business school and, and ask them if they would be willing to advocate for you, right? You phrase it in a different way to sort of gauge whether they're really going to be someone who um, is uh, is going to say great things about you, really be your champion, really be on your side and, and um, be willing to invest themselves in the process. Um, and, and so, you know, I think at this stage, um, it, it's good to start to have those, those conversations. And if it's someone perhaps that you haven't been in touch with for a while, right? So it might be a former boss who you haven't been in touch with for, for a few months um, or, or longer. So uh, you don't want to be sort of springing this on them a, a, a few weeks before the deadline. So you should be sort of cultivating those relationships at this stage. And then in terms of maximizing the, 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 the 120 days, uh, I think we published um, the 100 day countdown. So if you, you've got exactly 20 days to read that countdown and then put it 
it into practice. Um, but in terms of research and, and school outreach, Judith, I mean, I'd love to head off to the West Coast and visit Stanford in July, but there won't be many students around. What, what can we do? You know, campus visits, but you know, just connecting perhaps with students, alumni, the admissions, what, what would you recommend for effective research of the schools? So the first thing, obviously, after this call, everyone's going to go online and sign up to start receiving updates from the schools that you're interested in um, and find out when there are going to be larger scale meetings, you know, online um, opportunities. Affinity groups often will have, hey, women's groups are going to meet and we'll tell you about what it's like to be a woman in business school or you know, this, this cultural background, that cultural background, this affinity group. Definitely, you know, get connected with those. Schools really have check boxes for I'm interested in learning more about X, Y, and Z. Um, you're going to want to start to use your network on LinkedIn, talk to some current students, reach out to people, as I mentioned earlier, five and 10 years out, set your Google alerts to look at faculty members that you might want to study with, um, interested in finding out more about them. Essentially, you're going to start to learn this language. Um, and I reckon it a lot, and I, I say it's a lot like learning a foreign language, because you want to start to immerse yourself in how do, what do they say about things? How do they call their small groups? You know, what, are, what do they call their lecture sections? Who are the faculty members that I might want to study with? Um, and so it's, there's some very practical things that you're going to be doing that Caroline mentioned. And I really look at the summer like a summer immersion in business school culture. So you're going to start to understand what sets Dartmouth across, you know, apart from University of Virginia, from Wharton, from Columbia, and in your own mind, start to say, hey, this really appeals to me. Or, you know, I'm, I'm much happier in a smaller environment. So that's kind of what, what I like to see happen at the start of the 120 days. Do yourself a favor. Don't be afraid of looking at the application. It's no great mystery. Print it out, see what they're asking you. You don't wanna be scrambling at the last minute to fill all of this stuff in. And the more you know, although it's a little overwhelming in the beginning, it'll start to feel much more manageable if you know what you're up against. So the schools are all gonna ask you for salary history, job descriptions, responsibility, You know, start to get some of these things together. Some of applying to business school is incredibly administrative, right? You're working on a resume, you're getting things lined up. And then some of it, the good part, I'm, I'm biased, but the good part is the introspective part. So while you begin to get to know your schools and to shrink that applicant pool as much as you can in your own mind, so it really is tailored to your interests and your focus, you also want to start to manage the process as well. Um, and, I, and I like to set this up 120 days you're really going to be ready to roll with getting things you know, in place by the beginning of August. So that to me is the month that you're kind of tying up the, the bows and, and you know, making everything look good. But up until then is your introspection and also your immersion in what the schools are all about. Right. So of course, uh, there, um, Judith had everyone going onto those websites. I'm going to take everybody before you sign up on the <laughs> Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Chicago Booth, Kellogg, Sloan, Columbia Inside, LVS uh, websites for all of those affinity groups. Those are fantastic uh, ideas. Of course, you know, LinkedIn and, and finding uh, individuals, maybe perhaps with common interests. Talk to us, you know, for, for over a decade, um, the initial conversations, um, we are, I have to say this, we are the gold standard uh, in the industry. People say, you know, I've talked to several firms, but I, I got nothing like the level of insight and input, advice, support, enthusiasm, guidance, uh, well, you can see from, from Caroline and, and Judith uh, and the rest of the team. So, you know, do reach out. Your Each of your stories is individual uh, to you. Um, we'll have more of these sessions where we'll be breaking down on a school-by-school -school, uh, basis uh, through those uh, MBA admissions masterclasses and all all of those resources. There is an extraordinary amount of resource uh, that Fortuna has put together on the YouTube channel, on the site, blogs for every school and every aspect of the uh, application process. Now, I had promised with some of the great questions, and I was seeing so many questions coming in, I was thinking, well, <laughs> where are we, how are we going to get through all these? I'll, I'll do a couple of quick ones and then remind myself of some of the earlier questions. Um, everything that we've said, Caroline, for the MBA, and you know the sort of the year ahead do you think it's equally true for the masters in management for exec mbas that the same sort of dynamics are at work well um with the full-time programs yes but less so with part-time modular formats like the executive mba so whereas the full-time programs tend to be counter-cyclical 
Um, that's not the case for part-time modular programs where people are usually working at the same time as they're studying. So in that case, you know, they don't have the issue of leaving their jobs and turning down great opportunities necessarily. Um, so whilst um, we may be going into a downturn in application volume for full-time programs, that's probably not the case for part-time programs like executive MBAs. And, and well, you talk about, of course, um, part-time programs and these different delivery forms. We are seeing more hybrid uh, and online programs. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Attendee had a child and they gave him or her the first name Anonymous. So Anonymous Attendee wants to, <laughs> wants to know and, and has asked us a handful of questions, but one of them was just, awesome. you know, where are we going? Um, do you think that we'll see incre increasing store and value, Caroline, placed on the online MBA and these hybrid models? I, I think it will become um, more common and, and more accepted as, um, you know, so much has switched online during the pandemic, you know, it really accelerated the digital transformation in, in so many areas. So um, I, I think that more people will, will go in that direction because they've become much more comfortable with doing so many more things and engaging online in a way that people didn't necessarily do pre-pandemic. Um, so it's definitely, you know, given a huge boost to online programs. Um, I would encourage people to look at, you know, at least at hybrid formats, because I do think that it it's still um, difficult to build the same quality of relationships uh, in a purely online form format. Um, compared to how you can do that when you're actually in a room physically with people. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some great hybrid formats out there as well. Um, so, you know, I would think very carefully about doing a purely online program um, because in the longer term, you know, if, when you speak to MBA graduates, a big part of the value that they get out of the program um, in the longer term is the network and those relationships that continue to pay dividends um, you know, decades down the road in the same way that maybe the knowledge that they learn in the classroom is not necessarily still, um, still, uh, you know, a, as relevant, but it's the relationships that are really um, generating a lot of value. And, and so uh, you need to think about whether you're going to get that same quality of network out of an online format. Right. The two of you uh, co-authored uh, an article uh, two, three years ago, I think, on, on Forbes, on Poets and Quants, about over 30s applying to business school. Now that article has been read by over 285,000 people. There are lots of over 30s. We didn't all decide at the age of 25, hey, I'm off to business school to get my MBA. Um, and you know, as we think about the upcoming year, for some that perhaps the clock is ticking, but Judith, just talk us through you know, over 30s. The schools are looking at them just as seriously as others, but I mean, do they have to be a little bit more specific about their career goals or anything, you know, that they then really want to bear in mind? I would say that if you're over 30 and applying to business school, you definitely have, you know, you're, you're in the, you're in the, you're in the pool. You definitely have as much opportunity. Um, schools want to make sure that you're employable after graduation. So I would say you want to be fairly thorough and direct about where you envision yourself going. Uh, you may not say, well, I'm going to do this. And if that doesn't work out, I'm going to do that. You definitely want to research the kinds of firms or organizations that you might be looking to do a summer internship with, right? So at 30 plus, you're, you've had, you know, eight or nine years of experience at that point. Um, schools are going to want to understand what your perspective is. Why is it that you're not necessarily applying to an EMBA? So, I, and, and nor do I think any of these things are a negative. I'm just sort of putting it out there. Be prepared to answer that pretty head on. You know, through my eight years of experience, I've learned about leadership, I've learned about teamwork, I've learned about this particular industry and function. Um, you know, my MBA is gonna help me career pivot because I'm fine that much more interested in healthcare and I wanna do this at that, you know, look, so, so the specificity can be very helpful, but a hundred percent, I mean, given all the things that we've just been talking about, being over 30 is, is you're, you're still very much in the application pool for the schools that we're, that we're talking about today. Not at all a problem, just something that you want to make sure that you talk about up front in your application. Right. We've talked about perhaps how a lot of um, uh, less traditional backgrounds might be entering the pool this year. They see it as, as a great chance for them. But in um, our question comes from someone whose bachelor's was more on the arts side. Uh, doesn't have a particularly strong uh, quant background. So 
the GMAT, the GRE would be a demonstration. Caroline, do you think um, taking additional courses are also good in the eyes of the admissions office? Well, I think, you know, if you do well on the GMAT or the GRE in, in the, um, the, the quant side, um, then that is sufficient, right? Um, you know, if you haven't got a strong academic quantitative background and that doesn't come through much in your work experience, then you do need to make sure that it comes through um, strongly in some aspect in your application, right? Because they do need the reassurance that you are um, not going to struggle with those um, core courses. So if you've done well on the on the quant um, test in the GMAT or the GRE, then I don't think you necessarily need to worry about doing any other courses. But if you're but if you're still concerned that maybe your performance is sort of average on those parts of the test, but not outstanding, then then uh, you know it could be helpful to do some additional courses. Um, you know, be, but beyond that, um, you might want to do some additional courses in any case for yourself to help you prepare for the for the program, right? And, and um, you know, many students um, do extra um, prep courses. Um, uh, just in order to, you know, be able to hit the ground running um, when they, when they get to school. So um, you might not necessarily need it for your application, but it might be something that you want to do before you get to campus. Okay, um, Judith, this one um, perhaps for for you. We have a number of the Fortuna team that are real aces working with the two plus two deferred enrollment uh, applicants. And if it's going to be your senior year in college, it's your senior year in college. So uh, that could be for the for the coming cycle. Do you think there's any um, specific advice you would give uh, those considering those deferred applications in the coming cycle? Is, is volume going to change or does that kind of remain stable because you've, you finish college when you do? I think that that is going to continue to rise. You know, we've seen it when I was at Wharton, there was really only a deferred entry. It was not called the MOLIS program. It was called submatriculation. It was for students that were currently enrolled at Wharton and were going to continue their Wharton degree. So there was not that gap. Um, excuse me, Harvard famously had the two plus two program, but a lot of other schools have gotten on the bandwagon. It's a fabulous way to lock in talent, right? You're sort of saying to these students that might have considered law school, we really are interested in you. Go and do whatever you want for two or three years and then come back. And so they're kind of encouraging students to, to get connected to the programs earlier. Um, they're coming out you know, excited about going to business school and recognizing that they have a little more flexibility and fluidity in, in what they may choose to do in that interim time. So I personally think that that's going to be the next great frontier, so to speak, for applicant and applicant numbers. Um, I also think that schools are going to find out very interesting ways to combine these with joint degrees. So perhaps there's going to be a deferred law MBA or a deferred med MBA. Um, you know, granted, this all puts a little bit of time on the back end. So people may be older when they're actually, you know, enrolling. Um, but I, I think that these numbers and these programs are only going to continue to grow in their, their, their actual opportunity. And then I think, I could be wrong on this, but I think in their complexity as well. So opportunities that are being offered to students that, um, that might, you know, again, go the deferred entry route. Right. In the last decade with Fortuna Caroline, um, our clients, not just tremendous success rates at the top schools, but I mean, they've been uh, awarded tens of millions of scholarship dollars. And, and, and that's always been so wonderful to see. Perhaps trying time some of the questions about how those scholarship decisions are made, you know, great applicants and how that could affect a scholarship decision. You, you were actually you know, making those final decisions uh, versus um, perhaps different parts of their, their demographic, a test score that you know, could also influence. Just talk us through some of perhaps the, the bigger threads that were then being made uh, in the admissions office and questions around financial aid. Right. Well, so there are different types of financial aid. Um, there's merit based um, uh, aid and then there's, um, you know, pure financial aid where it's really just based on on financial need. Um, so, you know, merit based awards may be made at the time of admission um, admission. And it's really where the school is looking to, as Judith talked about earlier, you know, make sure that they secure that candidate and, and they are aware that that candidate may be getting offers from other schools and uh, as well as scholarship offers from other schools and so the schools are um, often in competition for the very best candidates and so you know they will use 
um, scholarships to to help to sort of sweeten the deal and um, secure that candidate. Um, and I think that, you know, as we talked about earlier, Wharton really made a splash with shifting to um, uh, just over 50%, 51% women and other schools are, are um, chasing that goal as well, trying to reach gender parity. And, and so I think that there, you know, it's a very good time to be applying as a woman to business school. I, and I think that, you know, some of the merit-based awards and, and scholarship awards um, might go disproportionately to women in the next, you know, especially in the next um, season, if there is a downturn in application volume, there will be even greater competition for those great women candidates. Um, and then otherwise, you know, it, it, it varies by school and I would, uh, the schools do publish a lot of information about the, the scholarship processes and financial aid and it, it's, um, it, it does vary. And, and so I would encourage people to, to you know, spend some time um, reading up on the different processes at the different schools um, so that, you know, you know what the opportunities may be for you. Um, but often there will be a combination of, um, you know, an application where the candidate, where the, where the school will be looking at um, whether that candidate is a good fit um, for the criteria for the scholarship and whether they actually have financial needs, right? And they will be looking at um, the, the financial background of the candidate, what they've been earning, um, what savings they have, um, uh, you know, what um, financial um, commitments they have, the supporting family and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the schools take it very seriously in, in trying to, um, you know, spend that money very wisely and, and support people. And, and, you know, they really do want to make it feasible for, for people um, to, uh, to pay um, for, for the program, right? They want to, once someone's been admitted to the program, they want to make sure that they actually can um, manage the, 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 the financial commitment as well. And so schools are really trying very hard to support candidates in that. Um, so I would say, you know, um, my advice is you do your research because it does vary a lot by school. And there, will, there are a lot of different scholarships that you can potentially qualify for. And, and that's something that you need to look at, see where you're, you know, where, which scholarships are the best fit for you. And, um, and uh, you know, apply early because sometimes um, scholarships go earlier in the season rather than later. Right, right. So, um, Tejas, um, with your 760, but worrying if a quant 48 is an Indian uh, man, reach out to us and let's talk about it. Jacob, same thing, professional qualifications, can they be rated as equivalent to a degree? get in touch with us and we will talk that through with you um the strategy sessions that we offer we take them incredibly seriously you know uh, with judith with caroline with other colleagues you know we're talking about um model un and how it joins dots with perhaps something you've then been doing at a big four uh, and some years later we know we find out the the musical instruments that you've played the passions that you have but you know, and that's important with the sort of discussions that we're then trying to have uh, to really help you in your next steps. Now, I hope that today's uh, masterclass, as we look at the upcoming uh, admission cycle for 2022-2023, has been helpful to try and find that document with the 100 day or the 120 day um, sort of timeline, everything that you can be thinking of. Uh, starting with Harvard, they normally have the first round one deadline, I think it's on September the 8th this year, and then Stanford, Wharton and other schools in the days and the weeks that follow. But do reach out so that we can, uh, you know, share such uh, great experience and insights uh, from my colleagues and join us next Wednesday. Uh, we'll be doing another MBA admissions masterclass series. Uh, but for today, I want to thank both uh, Caroline and Judith and to all of you. Uh, for joining us, for coming up with so many great questions, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.